U.S. intelligence officials fear that most of Hamas' remaining captives in the Gaza are already dead. That's according to a report in the Wall Street Journal. Hamas kidnapped some 220 people, including foreigners, when it launched its attack on Israel on October 7. In the course of the war, a temporary ceasefire saw the exchange of some Palestinian captives held in Israeli jails. Israel estimates about 34 captives have died, but the journal reported on Thursday that some U.S. officials believe that number should be more than twice as high, which could complicate efforts to reach a new ceasefire. The intelligence sources, who were not identified, said some of the captives died from the injuries they sustained in the Hamas attack, while others succumbed to the illness. The report also found some may have also been killed in Israel's ongoing assault on the territory. Meanwhile, hundreds have been marching in Tel Aviv against the government of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu demanding a hostage deal after Hamas denied having 40 living hostages to meet humanitarian criteria for exchange with Israel. The protesters reacting to Hamas' claim marched through busy streets, waving Israeli flags, beating drums and chanting slogans. The hostage exchange proposal backed by Qatari and Egyptian mediators includes swapping women, children and the elderly including five Israeli female soldiers in exchange for 900 Palestinian prisoners held by Israel. Israel is claiming that Hamas is still holding 133 hostages, including toddlers and the elderly, and that 36 of them are confirmed dead. We are demanding today for the release, the immediate release of all hostages by a deal. We are demanding that from our government. And we know there is a price, but we are ready to pay that price. Whether they are alive or dead, we want them back. Because without them here in Israel, there is no closure and there is no security. How can we feel secure without knowing that wherever we are, the government and the state is there to bring us back? We want a deal for the return of all hostages and also for the relief of the Gazan people. We need a humanitarian relief as well for them. This deal is needed, and this deal is needed for our future and the future of our children. Nothing good will come out of hunger and chaos. At least 29 people have been killed after Israeli aircraft launched raids on a home in Daraj neighborhood of Gaza City. Dozens more were wounded in the attack as emergency workers continued search and rescue operations from the rubble of a blown-out building. Israeli military helicopters also dropped bombs on the northern part of the Nusirat camp, a refugee shelter which has repeatedly come under fire in recent days as Israeli forces intensify operations. According to the Gaza Health Ministry, at least 89 more people have been killed in Israeli attacks on the Gaza Strip in the past 24 hours, taking the overall death toll since the war began to at least 33,634. In the meantime, the United States has restricted travel for its embassy personnel in Israel amid fears of an attack by, the, by Iran. The U.S. embassy said staff had been told not to travel outside the greater Jerusalem, Tel Aviv or Beersheba areas out of an abundance of caution. In the same vein, the United Kingdom advised its citizens to avoid traveling to Israel and that the occupied Palestinian territory. Iran's mission to the United Nations suggested that any Iranian military response to a deadly Israeli air raid on the Iranian consulate in Damascus could have been averted if the UN Security Council had denounced Israel's attack.
The Iranian statement comes amid a growing number of media reports that an Iranian attack on Israel or Israeli interests is imminent. Iran has promised to carry out a decisive response to the Israeli attack that killed seven members of its Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, including two generals in Damascus on April 1st. The Israeli assaults and anticipated Iranian retaliation have raised fears of an all-out regional war in the Middle East amid the raging conflict in Gaza, intensifying tensions and a chorus of calls for de-escalation. And a specialized unit, United Nations Committee has failed to reach a consensus on Palestinian UN membership bid. Malta's ambassador and Security Council President Vanessa Frazier said two-thirds of the committee members were in favor of moving on with the membership, with many countries arguing that uh, Palestine fulfills all the criteria that are required to be granted full state member status. Mrs. Fraser said no one explicitly objected to the membership qualifications. She adds that all deliberations would be calculated in a draft report. However, if the committee doesn't agree on the report, it could hold another meeting to iron out any differences. She also noted that any UN Security Council member can still table a resolution to vote on the Palestinian membership at any time, regardless of the committee's report. to the other huge conflicts is this time in Europe. Uh, that's the uh, war between Russia and Ukraine. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has accused the West of turning a blind eye to his country's need for more air defenses. This comes as Russia destroyed the largest power generating plant in Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, in a missile attack on Thursday. Authorities say the Trapilska thermal power plant, which is the largest supply of electricity to Kyiv and two other regions, was completely destroyed in the attack. Officials said the plant was targeted by multiple missiles. Staff on shift were able to escape because they ran for cover as soon as the first drone hit. Residents were urged to shut their windows, charge all their devices and stock up on water. Ukraine's Air Force said it shot down 18 of the incoming missiles and 39 of the drones. Russia fired 82 missiles and drones in total, including six hypersonic Kinzhal missiles, none of which Ukraine's air defenses were able to shut down. Well, the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, Rafael Grossi, is warning of a potential nuclear accident in Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear plant. It comes as Russia launched multiple strikes on the power station, resulting in a direct hit to the main reactor building. One casualty was reported. Um, on Sunday... Direct attacks against the Saporizhia nuclear power plant marked a major escalation of the nuclear safety and security dangers in Ukraine, significantly increasing the risk of a nuclear accident. I firmly appeal to military decision makers to abstain from any action violating the IAEA's five concrete principles to prevent a nuclear accident and ensure the integrity of the plant and I urge the international community actively to work towards a de-escalation of what is a very serious situation. One of these attacks resulted in a direct hit on the reactor dome of Unit 6. Whilst the damage to the structure has not compromised nuclear safety, it is a serious incident with strikes on the ZNPP's primary containment, representing a step change, increase in risk to nuclear safety. 
The other two attacks were in close proximity to the main reactor buildings and resulted in at least one casualty. A further drone attack and bursts of rifle fire were reported on Tuesday, an ominous indication of an apparent readiness to continue these attacks despite the grave dangers they pose to nuclear safety and security. Meanwhile, the United States Department spokesperson Matthew Miller has been commenting on the Russian strikes on Ukraine's energy facilities, saying Kyiv needs fundings now more than ever. While Mr. Miller reiterated the need for Congress to pass President Biden's supplementary funding requests, he warned Washington expects Ukraine not to use U.S.-provided weapons for strikes outside its territory. He also touched down on the situation in the front line, saying troops are having to ration ammunition, urging Congress to act fast. We have seen Russia, unfortunately, um, continue to attack Ukraine's energy infrastructure. That's something they've done not just overnight, but over the past uh, couple of years. Um, and I would say it, it, for us, it comes back to the need for Congress to fully fund, fully pass the president's supplemental request. And it goes directly to this question you asked me about uh, the situation on the battlefield, where we have seen uh, Ukrainian armed forces having to ration uh, artillery shells, having to ration ammunition. And of course, that has an, ability, uh, an effect on their ability to fight the war and an effect on their ability to repel Russian troops. And it's why it is so urgent for Congress to act. We have made clear that we do not encourage strikes outside of Ukraine. And we do not enable those strikes with U.S. provided weapons um, and that we don't want to see U.S. provided weapons used for strikes outside Ukraine. Ultimately, uh, when it comes to deciding how to prosecute that's, this war, those are Ukrainian decisions, but um, we do not encourage or enable such strikes. In the meantime, the Russian Federal Security Service has detained six militants who it claims were preparing a terrorist attack against a Russian military facility in Donetsk. Video published by the Russian Federal Security Service shows officers breaking into a flat, detaining suspects and examining pieces of apparent weapons and explosive devices. The FSB said two ready-to-use explosive devices and several hand grenades were seized during the course of the raid. Authorities say those arrested were from Central Asian states, indicating they were planning to leave for Turkey from where they intended to cross to Ukraine. However, Ukraine has not commented on this move by Russia. Well, the European Union Parliament has voted against approving a critical EU Council funding that will provide Ukraine with additional weapon systems. The plenary session was held in Brussels with 515 members of parliament voting in favor and 62 voting against the move. However, Belgium, which proposed the budget move, called for delegates to delay the vote onto the next plenary session this month. I have a, in fact a point of order to ask you to change the agenda uh, of, uh, uh, of today, because uh, today I'm, I have to tell you I'm that sick of what is happening uh, in Ukraine. That sick, why? Because as you have all seen the last 20 days, there are these numerous attacks uh, by the Russians on the ordinary cities of Ukraine, hospitals, power installations, apartment blocks. And what I find scandal is that Europe, who is opening the door for Ukraine, and the European Council is not even capable in such an urgency to decide to send a number of anti-missile systems to Ukraine. In total, Mr. President, Mr. Borrell told us that 100 of these Patriot systems in Europe, and they asked seven to protect their cities. And we Europeans, we invite them to come to the European Union, but are not capable to do so. And my proposal to you, Mr. President, is that we in any way, all these discharges eh, of all these institutions, 55 in total, that we put them on the next agenda in Strasbourg. And before we don't discharge them, until the Council, who can easily 
make an agreement on that, do a meeting to deliver these seven Patriot systems to Ukraine. At least the discharge of the Council, at least I propose that the discharge of the Council is withdrawn of the agenda. Let's get more on this. The VOA's Anna Chernikova joins us now from Kiev. Anna, great to see you today. Good evening. Right, so what more do we know about the Russian missile strike on Kiev's largest power plant? Uh, well, it was one of probably one of the uh, one of the biggest uh, strike and one of the um, most resultive strikes uh, on the energy and uh, energy system uh, in Kiev and Kiev region, particularly because this plant is located just around 40 kilometers from the city of Kyiv itself and it was responsible for uh, for for the supply of three regions including Kyiv region and the city of Kyiv so uh, it was really a, a very bad strike and uh, uh, people actually are extremely upset and uh, I can even say that there is a, a slight panic um, in Ukraine because of the fact that uh, actually uh, Russian forces managed to uh, to heat this plant uh, this plant uh, next to Kyiv because well Kyiv is uh, has the most uh, systems that can actually uh, destroy such kind of missiles and uh, uh, this type of missile um, is a new type that Russian Federation is using and um, Russian forces already tried to attack Kyiv twice with these missiles and uh, both times uh, in Kyiv uh, they were destroyed, but in Kyiv region it was uh, it was not. So uh, at this point there are uh, there are difficulties with energy supply. No uh, no cuts uh, yet, but um, still uh, Ukrainian officials uh, inform uh, society that society should make sure that. Mm, during this peak hours in the evening and uh, in the morning, uh, the, the energy supply should be, uh, well, people should try to restrict themselves in order to avoid uh, this, you know, cuts that uh, people already experienced back in 2022. Right, and authorities say the scale of destruction is terrifying. You just said that it's the, you know, biggest yet. Uh, were there any casualties and power cuts in Kyiv or other regions after the attack? Um, no casualties were reported. According to the officials, all the workers who were uh, who were at the plant at that moment, because this happened during the night, so uh, people were, uh, there were, it was a night shift present. Uh, so um, authorities say that, uh, representatives of the plant say that uh, no casualties were reported, so people uh, were in the shelter, and those who were at the plant, and they survived. Um, in terms of the cuts, a key region region uh, had certain, uh, well, on the day of the attack, uh, there were cuts, uh, electricity cuts and uh, electricity restrictions. At this point, situation is stable, more or less, but as I mentioned, uh, during the peak hours, um, authorities are, uh, are um, asking people to reduce this, the use of energy supply in order to avoid uh, cuts. But again, uh, it is expected that situation might, might get worse. And President Volodymyr Zelensky stepping up, you know, renewed calls for weapons to fight Russian aggression. He said the West is turning a blind eye. Do you think Ukraine is really getting all the attention it needs from Western allies? Well, Ukraine definitely needs more. And uh, at this point, uh, it is a very difficult situation in terms of munition, in terms of equipment, and the Ukrainians are... Here again, I'm talking about feelings inside the country. People do feel, uh, you know, worried a lot because um, there is a feeling that less missiles uh, for air defense um, and this creates additional risk to the cities uh, and to even those cities uh, located um, far from the front line. Uh, also, on on the front line, situation is extremely difficult and. Yeah, some uh, villages, some towns were, um, well, were given up, not given up, but uh, Russian forces managed to occupy due to the fact that there is not enough equipment and ammunition. 
So um, Ukraine needs support, needs more uh, more military support, particularly, and especially amid the fact that Russian forces is preparing new offensive. As the, well, everyone in Ukraine is talking about this and get ready. So um, yeah, Ukraine would definitely need uh, not just more people to fight, uh, which was already. Uh, which is already discussed in the new mobilization bill, uh, was just uh, voted yesterday, uh, but also Ukraine needs support uh, in terms of equipment. Yes, and we did understand in some of the reports that uh, we had earlier that, you know, Kyiv uh, held, you know, the magic to defending Ukraine against Russian attack and for the power station or you know, to be hit so badly and, you know, the country couldn't do much about it. It means that, you know, Ukraine is in, you know, a dire situation and its allies are not helping. What can Ukraine do in this situation? Well, Ukraine should uh, probably uh, use, well, definitely use diplomatic ways and negotiate, negotiation ways, but also Ukraine has to well to increase its own production this is also what discussed and just recently a couple of days ago president zelensky also uh, mentioned that and he said that uh, actually uh, ukraine is uh, um well is the, it is already um in action of this new missile production uh, plan and also developing this missile production plan in order to to make sure that Ukraine has certain, you know, dependent sources without uh, the support from the allied independent sources uh, to fight. But again, we also have to understand that in terms of capability that Ukraine has and uh, considering that war, the full-scale invasion isn't going, the full-scale war isn't going, of course, Ukraine won't be able to, uh, even in the best case scenario, Ukraine won't, won't be able to produce as much as it needs. So, uh, but this should be definitely also done. So at this point, we see that Ukraine is trying to improve its production, but, um, well, but um, I guess that uh, the faster way to, get uh, enough well equipment needed and um, ammunition needed would be to continue the negotiation with the allies and of course uh, everyone has their own you know um, priorities to think of and um, it's getting more and more difficult as time goes it's anna you know talking about the allies we know that u.s aid is still stalling in congress and the eu parliament also voted against approving ukraine aid funding um, is there anything that Ukraine is doing wrong or something that it's not doing right, that the allies are stalling, you know, in this critical uh, situation that uh, Ukraine finds itself? Well, unfortunately, we have to, 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 to you know, to be uh, honest with ourselves. Of course, uh, it's third year of war. And um, we can see from the past uh, wars and past conflicts around the world that well, this is quite a long time. Of course, we understand that this is a war happening in, in Europe uh, well, the, for the first time in, in such scale after the Second World War. So uh, Ukraine and Ukraine, uh, ha well, Russia is a bigger, much bigger uh, in terms of the territory, in terms of the capabilities, in terms of the um, personnel, military personnel available for, for such fight. So, you, and Russia is definitely much more prepared for, for the wars in Ukraine uh, because Ukraine, well, never been to war after the Second World War before this one, so, um, uh, before 2014. So, uh, I should say that, well, probably Ukraine just, um, well, Ukraine needs to consider the fact that uh, countries which are supporting Ukraine, they also have their internal issues to deal with and internal questions. So uh, Ukraine definitely has to remi continue to remind everyone about the fact that the war is still ongoing and um, there are still diplomatic ways to, uh, to negotiate the help. So yeah, Ukraine just has to continue to do it and uh, improve as well, um, improve itself in, in such negotiations. Thanks again, Anna, and please do stay safe. Thank you.